Hello, my dear friends. Today we will take a look at the memoirs of a German lieutenant during the Great War. These are the first memories of this period of time which I decided to share. The point is that they inspired me with a very graphic and, I think, detailed and accurate portrayal of the feelings and emotions of a soldier who was engaged in battle. In my opinion, Ernst Jünger, the author of these memoirs, was surprised by his own actions after the battle. In fact, during this fierce battle, he sometimes showed unnecessary cruelty, but sometimes he showed mercy that was dangerous for his own life. It can be evident in his memories that the decisions he made during the battle were not the decisions made by his mind, but by his heart, emotions, and reflexes. So here we go. The battalion was quartered in Brunmont Castle. We found out that on the night of March 19th, we are supposed to move to the front line and take a wait-and-see position in the shell holes near Kanyakor, and that the great storm is appointed for the morning of March 21st, 1918. The regiment was ordered to break through between the villages of Ecusemont and Nore, known since the Somme retreat, and, if chance came, to reach Moré on the first day. The day passed with us in a depressed spirit, and we slept almost all the time. I often rushed to report to the battalion commander, as new questions arose concerning the storming. The rest of the time, while lying on the bunks, I conversed with both my officers about mundane things, banishing painful thoughts. The constant refrain was, nothing could be worse than a bullet, thank God. The brief speech I tried to encourage the men who were sitting silently on the ladder had no effect, and I had no spirit to encourage anyone. At 10 p.m., a messenger delivered the order to move to the front line. When a wild beast is pulled from its cave, or when a seaman watches a lifeboard float away from under his feet, their emotions are comparable, perhaps to those we felt when we left our safe, warm adit and set out into the inhospitable night. After running under the heaviest shrapnel fire of the Felix Trench, we reached the front with no casualties. While we were making our way through the entrenchments, the artillery was moving into advanced firing positions on the bridges above our heads. The regiment, whose front battalion we were, had been assigned a very narrow section. The tunnels overflowed with men at once. The men who remained dug holes in the trench walls in order at least to shelter themselves from the artillery fire that would precede the storming. After a long search, everyone found a place. Captain von Brixen again summoned the company commanders to a meeting. Having checked our watches for the last time, we parted with shaking hands. Waiting for the time of 5.05 a.m., the moment when the artillery preparation should begin, I settled down on the ladder with both my officers. My spirits had improved slightly as the rain had stopped and the stellar night promised a dry morning. We spent the time in telling stories and having a meal. We smoked a lot, and a full flask went around. In the early morning hours, the enemy's artillery became so active that we were afraid whether the British had sniffed out anything. Several ammunition stacks spread over the area blew up. Just before the beginning, the following was reported on the radio. His Majesty the Kaiser and Hindenburg have driven into the field of war. This report was greeted with applause. The hand was moving forward, and we counted the last minutes. Finally, it stopped at 5.05 a.m. The storm had burst. A curtain of flame, followed by a sudden, unprecedented roar, surged upwards. The mad thunder, which swallowed up the heaviest salvos with its mighty roars, shook the earth. The inexorable howl of annihilation raised from behind the incalculable guns, was so horrible that even the biggest of battles that had been fought out seemed like child's play in comparison. Something happened that we had never dared to hope for. The enemy's artillery was silent. It was wiped out by a single mighty attack. We couldn't stay in the tunnel. We stood on the covering and gazed with rapture at the high, tower-like wall of fire blazing over the British trenches, covered with swirling blood-red clouds. Our joy was spoiled by a painful burning of the mucosa, causing tears. The fumes of our own gas shells, brought in by the headwind, enveloped us in a strong odor of bitter almonds. I watched anxiously as some of us were already coughing and gasping and finally pulling off their gas masks. Watching this, I tried to suppress my coughing fits and control my breathing. Slowly the smoke cleared, and in a moment, we took off our gas masks. The afternoon came. Behind us, a terrible rumbling sound was constantly growing. A wall of smoke, ash, and gas, impenetrable to the eye, appeared in front of us. Soldiers ran through the trench, roaring cheers in each other's ears. 
infantrymen and artillerymen, engineers and telephonists, Prussians and Bavarians, officers and entire crews, all expressed enthusiasm at this spontaneous demonstration of our strength and were eager to begin the assault at precisely 9.40 a.m. At 8.25 a.m., the heavy mortars, which were in the narrow corridors behind the front trench, joined the battle. We could see 200-kilogram mines flying in the air, making large trajectories, and somewhere in the distance, a volcanic detonation was hitting the ground. Their explosions stretched a long train of erupting craters. It felt as if the laws of nature had lost their power. The air sparkled as it did on hot summer days, and its variable density caused solid objects to dance. Through the clouds, the black streaks of shadows glided. The howl became absolute. It couldn't be heard. It was only vaguely visible as thousands of rear machine guns heaved their laden fountains into the sky. The last hour of preparation was more dangerous than the four previous hours, during which we had been able to move safely around the shelter. The enemy had fired a heavy battery. A stream of shells showered on our overcrowded trench. Fleeing from them, I went to the left and ran into the adjutant, Lieutenant Hines, who asked about Baron von Solmacher. He takes command of the battalion. Captain von Brixen has just been killed. Appalled by this terrible news, I wandered back and crawled into a deep hole. But during the short way, I had already forgotten about it. My brain was fixed on reality, only by the number 940. Non-commissioned officer Dusifkin, who had accompanied me to Rennieville, was standing in front of my hole. He asked me to move into the trench because at the slightest tremor, blocks of ground might collapse on me. An explosion interrupted his words. He collapsed to the ground with his leg torn off. Having jumped over him, I ran to the right, where I climbed into a hole which was already occupied by two sapper officers. Very close to us, the heavy shells continued to rage. All of a sudden, black clods of ground whirled up out of the white cloud. The explosion was drowned out by a general rumble. There was nothing more to be sounded at all. Three of the men from my company were blown to pieces in the corner of the trench on our left. One of the last unexploded shells killed poor Schmidtchen, who was sitting on the ladder. Together with Springer, with watch in my hands, I stood near my hole expecting the great moment. The remnants of the company had gathered around us. We managed to lighten them up with some coarse simple jokes and to amuse them a little. Lieutenant Meyer, who looked out from behind the crossbar for an instant, later told me that he thought we were mad. At 9.10 a.m., the officer patrols guarding our position moved away from the trench. Since the two positions were 800 meters apart, we had to move out while it was still the preparation and spread out to no man's land so that we could break through the first enemy line at 9.40 a.m. After a few minutes, Springer and I, accompanied by our men, also climbed onto the cover. Let's prove what the 7th Company is capable of. I don't give a damn now. Let's avenge the 7th Company. Let's avenge Captain Von Brixen. Pulling out our pistols, we dashed over the wire, through which the first wounded men were already climbing towards us. I took a look to the right and to the left. The line separating the nations was a strange scene. In the shell holes in front of the enemy's trench, around which the fire was raging constantly, the assault battalions were waiting for their time patiently on an immensely wide front, huddled together in bunches of companies. It seemed to me that a breakthrough was unavoidable in the face of these crowded masses. Wasn't there a power in us that could break up the enemy's reserves and tear them apart, annihilating them? I expected it with confidence. It looked as if the last battle, the last dash, was to be fought. Out here, the fate of nations was under iron trial. It was a matter of possession of the world. I guessed, though I did not completely realize the meaning of the moment, and I think that everyone understood that the personality disappeared in the face of the weight of responsibility that fell upon them. Those who have experienced such moments know that the rise and fall in the history of nations depends on the outcome of battles. There was a remarkable atmosphere. The supreme tension had inflamed it. The officers maintained their martial bearing and exchanged jokes with excitement. Occasionally, a heavy mine would fall very close to us, throwing up a fountain high as a bell tower and covering the awaiting men with earth, and no one would duck his head. The rumble of the battle was so terrible that the senses were disturbed. There was something overwhelming in that rumble that left no room in the heart for fear. Everyone became fierce and unpredictable, being carried into some superhuman landscapes. Death became meaningless. The desire of living turned to something greater and it made everyone blind and apathetic to their own fate. About three minutes before the attack, my batman, Faithful Finky, beckoned me with a flask filled. I took a deep sip. It was as if I were drinking water. 
The only thing missing was a combat cigar. An airwave extinguished my match three times. The great moment had come. A wave of fire swept across the front trenches. We went on the offensive. It was with mixed emotions of bloodlust, rage, and inebriation that we marched heavily but steadily, advancing on the enemy lines. I marched at a distance from the company, accompanied by Finky and one recruit named Haki. My right hand clutched the hilt of my pistol, my left hand the bamboo stack. I was seething with rabid anger that engulfed me and all of us in the most incomprehensible way. The urge to slay, which was stronger than me, was urging my steps. The rage squeezed bitter tears out of me. A monstrous will to destroy that weighed heavily over the battlefield was thickening in my brain and plunging into a red mist. Stammering and gasping, we shouted jerky phrases to each other, and an indifferent spectator would have thought that we were overwhelmed by an excess of happiness. With no difficulty, we crossed the tattered and tangled barbed wire and jumped over the first hardly recognizable trench. The storming wave danced across the flattened gully like a round dance of ghosts through the white tangling fumes. Unexpectedly, a machine gun burst from the second line towards us. I jumped with my comrades into a shell hole. A moment later, there was a terrible rumble, and I fell down forward. Finky grabbed me by the collar and turned me over onto my back. Her lieutenant is wounded. There was no sign of anything. The recruit had a hole in his shoulder, and he moaned that the bullet had hit him in the backbone. We pulled off his uniform and bandaged him up. The long furrow was a sign that shrapnel had hit the edge of the shell hole at the level of our faces. It was miraculous that we were alive. In the meantime, the others were ahead of us. We dashed after them, abandoning the wounded man to his own fate, but nevertheless managed to stick a plank with a white piece of gauze beside him for the orderlies following the stormers. To our left, obliquely from us, a huge railroad embankment, a cruce croisille, which we needed to cross, rose out of the fog. From the embrasures built into the tunnel, there was such heavy rifle and machine gun fire as if a large bag of peas had been turned out. Finky had disappeared. I was moving through a ravine, on both sides of which the dugouts embedded in the mound were gaping. In rage, I stepped on the black, heaved earth, still fuming with the poisonous gases of our shells. I was all alone, and suddenly I spotted the first enemy. Someone evidently wounded with his hands on the ground was squirming about twenty paces away from me in the middle of a ruined ravine. I saw that figure straighten up when I appeared and stared at me with wide open eyes, while I, hiding my face behind my pistol, approached him slowly and viciously. There was a bloody scene without an audience. What a relief to finally see the enemy in front of me in person. Gritting my teeth, I put the muzzle to the temple of the poor man, who was paralyzed with fear, and with the other hand I clutched at his uniform. With a pitiful moan, he fumbled in his pocket and held a picture card up to my eyes. It was a portrait of him among his large family, like some kind of spell from a bygone, incredibly distant world. Miraculously, I managed to restrain my insane rage and moved on. From above, men from my company jumped down into the ravine. I was intolerably hot. I tore off my overcoat and threw it upwards. I also shouted vigorously several times, Now you see Lieutenant Younger will take off his overcoat! And the rifleman laughed as if I had said something very witty. Up above, everyone was running through cover, disregarding the machine guns, which were at most 400 meters away from us. The instinct of annihilation pulled me into those vortexes of fire. I climbed the fire-breathing mound. In one of the shell holes, I ran into a pistol-shooting figure in corduroy. It was Kios, who was in a similar attitude. Instead of greeting me, he handed me a whole handful of ammunition. Thus, I concluded that I had shot a good deal on my short way because I had stocked up ammunition thoroughly before the assault. But I have not any personal memories of this period of time. The state of affairs was such that we were separated from the railroad embankment, which towered in front of us like a strong fortress rampart, by a ruined field covered with hundreds of dead British. On this field, as in an anthill, countless one-to-one -one battles were being fought. Later, Kios told me details which I took with about the same feeling as if I had heard a third-person narrative of the wild escapades committed by someone in a frenzy. Thus, using hand grenades, he chased some British man around a section of the trench. When the grenades ran out, he used solid clods of earth to hold his enemy, on the move, all the time, and while Kios was telling the story, I stood on the shelter and laughed. With adventures like these, we quietly reached the mound, which was incessantly, like a perpetual motion machine, scattering fire. This is where my memories begin again, and it was with the feeling of an extremely favorable combat atmosphere. 
The bullets spared us, and since we were standing close to the mound, it became our shelter instead of an obstacle. As if awoke from a deep sleep, I saw that the German helmets were moving toward us across the trenched field. They were rising out of the ground, tilled by the fire like an iron crop. Simultaneously, I saw that right at my feet someone was firing from the sack-covered window of the tunnel. The sound was so loud that we recognized only by the shaking of the muzzle that the weapon was in action, the defender of the tunnel being only an arm's length away from us. In this immediate closeness to the enemy was our salvation. In such moments, the heart brims with demoniacal joy. I shot through the cloth. The soldier next to me tore it off and threw a grenade into the hole. The blow and the whitish cloud streaming from it showed no doubt of the effect it had. The method was brute, but it was a proven one. So we ran along the mound to handle the next holes in a similar manner and suppress resistance. In this manner, we tore the main spines out of the backbone of the enemy's defenses. I raised my hand, giving a sign to our men, whose shells flew from a short distance away, echoing in their ears. They nodded cheerfully. I and a hundred other men immediately climbed the mound. For the first time in the whole war, I saw one mass breaking into another. The British occupied two terraced trenches on the rear mound. The shooting was at short range, the grenades falling with high trajectories in the air. I jumped into the first trench, rushing over the nearest crossbar. I ran into a British officer. His uniform was unbuttoned and his tie was dangling. Without using my pistol, I seized him by the throat and tossed him onto the sandbag, in front of which he collapsed. From behind appeared the graying head of the major, who shouted to me, Finish that dog! I delegated this work to the others, moving on to the lower trench, which was swarming with British, and began to shoot them with such fury that after the last shot, I pulled the trigger ten more times. A soldier beside me was throwing grenades at the fleeing men. A bowler-shaped helmet whirled into the air. The battle was over in a minute. The British jumped out of the trenches and rushed across the open field to their battalions. From the ridge of the mound a furious fire came down frantically upon them in pursuit. The fleeing men were falling on their backs, and in a few seconds the ground was covered with corpses. Only a few managed to escape. With an irresistible urge to shoot, I grabbed my rifle from a non-commissioned officer who was staring at the scene with his mouth hanging open. My first victim was a British man who was caught by me at a distance of 150 meters from the middle between two Germans. He folded up like a penknife, and remained lying there. Both Germans halted for a moment, wondering where help had come from, and then continued their way. After the job was done, we moved on. The success inflamed the aggressiveness and heedlessness of everyone to a white-hot fury. There was no talk of commanding unified units. Nevertheless, everyone knew only one password, forward, and everyone rushed forward. I chose as my target a small hill on which I could observe the ruins of a house, a grave cross, and a broken airplane. My stubborn striving for advance led me to the wall of fire on my own firing rampart. I was obliged to dash into a shell hole to take cover and wait out the onward march of fire. Beside me I found a young officer of another regiment, who, similar to me, was alone rejoicing in the success of the first attack. The common enthusiasm in a few moments brought us so close together as if we were acquainted for years. The next leap separated us forever. Even those terrifying moments were not without humor. The soldier next door to me, holding his rifle to his cheek, was about to shoot, as if hunting an unlucky rabbit that had ventured to run across our lines. It was so ridiculous that I couldn't help but laugh. Nothing could be scarier than when some daredevil decides to have a little fun. There was a small trench near the ruins of the house, the bottom of which was swept clean by machine guns on that side. I jumped into it. It was empty. At once, Lieutenants Kius and von Vettelstedt appeared. Vettelstedt's last liaison shot in the eye, did not manage to jump and fell down dead. Witnessing the fall of this last man of his company, Vettelstedt pushed himself against the wall of the trench and wept. He did not survive to see the end of the day either. There was a well-fortified position in the gully, and in front of it, on both thickened edges of the gully were two machine gun firing points. A wall of fire had already swept over this position. The enemy seemed to have rested and was shooting wherever he could. We were distanced from him by a strip of 500 meters. Over it, like swarms of bees, were buzzing sheaves of exploding shells. After taking a break, a small group of us rushed from our trench to the enemy. The battle was not for life, but for death. In a few jumps, my comrade and I found ourselves face to face against the machine gun point on the left. I could clearly see the head in a flat helmet from behind a small earthen berm 
and next to it a thin column of smoke curling upward. I came close in short leaps, wasting no time in aiming, and ran in a zigzag to draw the muzzle of the rifles away from me. Each time I lay down, a soldier tossed me a clip of ammo, and I was able to fire a few accurate shots. Ammo! Ammo! Looking back, I saw a soldier lying on his side, squirming in convulsions. To the left, where the resistance was not yet so severe, a few men appeared who were able to reach the defenders with hand grenades. The last jump, and I, tripping over the iron wire, flew into the trench. The British, under fire from all sides, dropped their weapons and rushed to the right trench. The machine gun was there, half hidden under a huge pile of brass cartridges. It was red hot and still smoking. In front of it, there was a man of athletic build whose eye had been blown out by a shot in the head, which I had been responsible for. The huge man with the large white eyeball under his charred skull had a frightening appearance. As I was thirsty, I did not spend a long time there, but went in search of water. One tunnel drew my attention. I looked inside and found a man down below who was spreading out cartridge belts on his knees, putting them in order. In all probability, he had no idea yet about the change of circumstances. I aimed calmly at him, but did not shoot him at once, as cautiousness dictated, but first shouted out, Come here! Hands up! He jumped up, stared at me dumbfounded, and disappeared into the darkness of the tunnel. I threw a grenade after him. There was probably one more exit at the tunnel, because an unknown man appeared behind the crossbar and succinctly announced, The shooters are dead! Finally, I found a can of cool water. I gulped the oily liquid, refilled the British flask, and gave way to the others who had suddenly crowded into the trench. As a curiosity, I will mention that when I arrived in this machine gun nest, my first thought was of the cold I was at that time suffering from. My inflamed tonsils had been bothering me for a long time. I instantly took hold of my throat and found to my delight that the first-class bath I had left behind me had healed it. In the meantime, the machine gun nest and the crew of the ravine, lying sixty meters ahead of us, continued to struggle viciously. The guys defended themselves with true flair. We attempted to aim the British machine gun at them, but to no avail. And moreover, while we were attempting to do so, a shell whistled near my head, grazed the Jaeger lieutenant standing beside me, and wounded one soldier in the thigh dangerously. The handgun crew, more fortunate, brought their gun to the edge of our small trench crescent and hurled a whole burst of shells into the flank of the British. The attackers from the right availed themselves of this instant confusion and headed by our so far intact Ninth Company, commanded by Lieutenant Hipkins, rushed upon the ravine. From all the shell holes, figures waving rifles arose with savage yells, attacked the enemy's position, from which hundreds of the defenders came out with their hands up. There was no mercy to anyone. The British, with hands raised high, rushed through the first storming wave back, where the rage of battle had not yet reached the boiling point. Hipkins's orderly had killed at least a dozen with his thirty-two shot pistol. I was watching this massacre, perpetrated on the edge of our small earthen fortification, as intently as from a theater box. This is where I realized that a defender, who, at a distance of five paces, shoots the invader in the belly, can expect no mercy. The fighter, who was blinded by a bloody mist at the moment of attack, does not want to capture. He wants to kill. He can see nothing in front of him and is captured by powerful primal instincts. It is only the sight of pouring blood that dispels the fog in his brain. He looks around as if awoken from a heavy sleep. Only then, he again becomes a conscious soldier and ready to face a new tactical mission. The active engagement in battles and trench skirmishes cost Ernst Jünger fourteen wounds, but he not only survived this harrowing war, but also lived more than a hundred and two years. He was born on March 29, 1895, in Heidelberg, and died on February 17, 1998, in a hospital in the small Swabian town of Riedlingen, not far from Stuttgart. That is all for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and support the channel by subscribing. Bye everyone, until next time.